going to be jumping into the dose escalation uh, part. And I'm just, this is just sort of like a fair warning. So this is a presentation which is typically designed or training which is designed for three hours. So I'm not obviously going to give um, the full three hours um, in, in this uh, time that we have. Uh, it's about 110 slides, but you're all going to be uh, given a copy of the slides, an electronic copy of the slides, so, and you can have it as a reference. So there are a lot of topics that are covered in there. I will pick and choose some from the single agent and the, dose and the dual agent so that you can at least get some feel about how the software works. Um, so in an ambitious uh, agenda, that three-hour version of the talk that I mentioned, these are the subjects that will be covered. There will be um, a rundown of all the single dose, uh, single dose escalation methods along with the workshop and a rundown of the, um, the dual agent methods in the workshop. But we're going to be focusing on uh, a number of them. So within this dose escalation module, um, you may or may not know that, uh, at least in the single agent methods, we are have included traditionally the 3 plus 3 design, which for historical reasons is because it's probably the most prevalent of the designs and has been used widely. And we want it to be compared in terms of its performance with the others. So along with the 3 plus 3 design, which is the single algorithmic one that we have, we have also added uh, a bunch of model-based approaches like the continual reassessment method and the Bayesian logistic regression model and the hybrid methods um, between the two, uh, which is the MTPI. Uh, approach, the uh, modified uh, uh, toxicity probability interval approach. So within those, uh, the single agent methods, we, we have, even with uh, version 6.4, we have made some additions and some changes. So with MTPI, for example, we have this user-specified decision table, which you can provide the clinicians at the beginning of the trial based on setting up the, um, uh, the design, and this is uh, sort of like the next best thing to the 3 plus 3 in terms of easiness for the, for the clinicians. The, one of the reasons that 3 plus 3 is so popular is that a clinician, you don't, have, don't need to have a statistician available. So they know a priori what the decision uh, tree is and how they will arrive at escalation or de-escalation options um, based on what they have observed in the last two cohorts. So this method, for example, has the same ambitions so that you can present the clinician ahead of time and tell them, well, okay, if you have, for example, 10 subjects uh, in your study and you have observed four toxicities, then the decision would be to stay at the current dose. Or if, instead, if you have five toxicities, the decision would be to de-escalate. With six, the decision would be to not only de-escalate, but also declare that dose level is unacceptable and never visit that or anything higher than that back in the process. And this is something that they might find you know, pretty useful, pretty easy to implement. It's just a um, predefined set of uh, decisions uh, which they can easily follow. So uh, this table and the, the fact that we can also edit this table if you want to override some of the decisions of it, uh, it's something, uh, it are some of the new features. Then we worked a lot on the stopping rules um, and making the stopping rules a bit more flexible and uh, organizing them better in terms of logical uh, decisions and logical operators. So for example, this is uh, a complex stopping rule that is being used uh, in some of the BLRM designs, the, the notion under our approach, where you would want for a dose level to be declared as an MTD, uh, the conditions that you, you would need at least six subjects treated at that dose, and either having the probability of falling in the targeted toxicity, targeted toxicity interval being greater than 50% a posteriori, or have at least 15 subjects in the trial up to that point. Okay? So a collection of rules like this corresponds to taking which rules you want from a laundry list of rules and then modifying the and or operators in order to be able to, to get to what you would like. Okay? Uh, depending on how complex you would like to build your stopping rules. And, but you will, we will see this uh, in action uh, when I get into the software. Uh, we have also included accelerated titration um, as an option to start up uh, any of your dose escalation designs. So you might be using 
instead of using cohorts of subjects, you can use single uh, cohort dose escalation and then switch to the design of your choice once you have reached the DLT, dose limiting toxicity. And finally, the, the combination of agents, which was one of the topics that um, last year around when we did this uh, tour of the West Coast with Sharik, and we at that point we had introduced the single agent dose escalation, and we were pretty happy about ourselves, you know, that we had uh, created this uh, in East. Uh, we, we showed it around and, you know, people said, okay, this is nice, but what about double agent dose escalation? I said, no, bummer. So we had to, you know, uh, get working and get the double agent dose escalation going. And that's why we added the two designs, because this is one of the most popular um, requests now. And you can see here, this is just a survey of, the, uh, of PubMed. When you are, if you search for cancer combination and phase one at the same time, you can see the increased popularity through the years uh, and it's still increasing. So on a side note, now that we are on this tour with, uh, with Sharik, now the next thing that we're hearing is, okay, well, the dose dual dose escalation is fine, but what about incorporating efficacy into your dose escalation as well? So you can never win. So now we have to you know, get, <laughs> get down and work on more things. And we actually have things. So I have a, um, a couple of slides in the end about what we are thinking about doing this efficacy and to toxicity joint modeling. So let's, with the single dose escalation, I'm just going to do a rundown of the methods. I'm not going to uh, spend a, lo a lot of time with this. Maybe focus and give you practice on, on one of the, the methods. Uh, but the background for this, just to give you so that we know what we are, um, the notation that we will have and what the setup will be, is that, are you able to see? So I don't want to stand in your way. We're going to have a, a sequence of fixed doses, D1 up to DK, and each one of them will have an unknown probability of toxicity. And the higher the dose level, the higher this unknown probability of toxicity will be. So we have this concept of monotonicity, and our goal is to find the maximum tolerated dose. So the highest possible dose, which will have a toxicity rate, which will be close, hopefully lower than a target toxicity rate uh, that you will predefine in the beginning, typically something in the order of 30 to 33%. Uh, or you can define an interval from, say, which is typically between 25 and 35%. Um, there are different requirements that leads you to the uh, need for these uh, methods. Uh, some of them uh, are ethical requirements, some of them are operational requirements. I have a list of them here. Uh, I just wanted to sort of like highlight the need to avoid overdosing, uh, exposing subjects to doses that are going to be uh, toxic systematically. Uh, also avoid uh, subtherapeutic doses. So enroll as many subjects as possible at acceptable uh, dose ranges. And what is more important from my view is to try and use all the information that you have efficiently. So do not waste any information. And this comes at odd with, for example, the three plus three design, which only takes into account information that you have in the last two cohorts. And you essentially uh, ignore anything that had happened uh, before that. So in that context, we have created, uh, we have a, a list of model-based um, algorithmic approaches and hybrid uh, approaches. I'm not going to sort of like explain the merits of one or the other, but within the presentation that you're going to be given, you're gonna, you can see pretty much what their difference is in terms of extensibility, flexibility, uh, and so forth. So I will leave this uh, for you uh, in, the, uh, in the electronic version of the presentation uh, that I will uh, give to you. But the only thing that I wanted to mention is this table, which essentially gives you what, uh, how the methods that we have available in East compare in terms of them uh, being utilizing the Bayesian philosophy, which is pretty much everything except for the three plus three, modeling the dose toxicity and how many parameters they involve in the uh, modeling, which this involves the CRM and the Bayesian logistic regression uh, model for dual and single agents and whether they utilize uh, probability intervals, toxicity probability intervals, or whether they utilize some sort of a point estimate for the toxicity. And again, you can see which ones uh, do what uh, in this uh, range of methods. So um, the, the most prominent one of all, the standard design is the three plus three design. It is the most prevalent. Um, you can see that from a survey of different 
uh, trials, phase one trials. So here between 91 and 90 and 2006, out of the 1,235 trials designed to find a maximum tolerated dose, 1,215 of them used a variant of this method. This is a trend that continued for the next uh, couple of years, survey for the next couple of years. Uh, and it is a pretty popular approach. And the reason why it's a popular approach is because it's pretty easy to implement. Actually, this graph here gives you pretty much a tree of decisions that you have to follow, the statistician or the clinician in it. So it's pretty clear how uh, the algorithm works and how you reach uh, this uh, maximum tolerated dose. There are different versions of the 3 plus 3 uh, design, depending on how conservative or how um, if you want to be conservative or not. And we have um, implemented three of those within EAST. So we have something that is called the low version, something that's called the modified low version, and something that's called the high version within the software. And pretty much the way that the, these differ, um, differ is by how they treat one toxicity out of three and two toxicities out of six. So uh, with this less conservative approach, for example, if you have one toxicity out of six, you would escalate to the next dose level. Uh, and if you have two toxicities out of six in the last two cohorts, so either one plus three, one out of three and one out of three, or zero out of three and two out of three, you would stop and choose that dose level as the MTD, while with the most conservative approaches, you would de-escalate. Uh, at the same time, um, depending on which one of these variants of the three plus three you're using, you have a different target toxicity in mind. So with this version, for example, the target toxicity that you have in mind is around that area of 33%. With the more conservative approaches, the target level of toxicity that you have in mind is something in the order of 17%. So there is this concept, this conception or misconception that you are targeting when you're using the 3 plus 3 design either something in the order of 17 or something in the order of 33% in terms of target toxicity. But it has been shown uh, that you're actually nowhere near that. Uh, there are simulations that suggest, and actually these simulations you can replicate within EAST, that the true target toxicity or an interval that you're actually uh, getting at when you are estimating the MTD is between 19 and 22 percent. Okay, so I have screenshots of different how you can perform different procedures, but we're going to see the most important ones in action, um, and I'm just going to move down to a laundry list of limitations of the three plus. This through the years there have been many things um, compiled about why you should not be using the three plus three, and there's always in a conference in adaptive designs a, a talk that will trash the the procedure and will uh, highlight the merits of some of the others. I, I have, but it's still you know popular. So I have listed here different things that I have been able to compile over time. As I said, in the first one you pretty much use information just from the last two cohorts and ignore anything that has happened up to that. You cannot re-escalate. Your cohort sizes are fixed, so you are rather restrictive. But the most important things are that you have a low probability of selecting the true MTD, has been documented by Thal and Lee, and high variability in the MTD estimates. And the other thing that I mentioned here is that you truly are not targeting a 33 or 17 percent, but your um, expected toxicity level at the MTD with the 3 plus 3 design is rather in the order of 19 to 22 percent. So with that, um, a lot of people have taken notice, certainly from the statistical community, but also from the regulators. Uh, and both in the U.S., they have gone as far in different guidances to mention that, well, the 3 plus 3 design may not be the most suitable one um, for gathering information. And in the European front, they have also gone a little bit further and saying that, well, you, sh you should actually take notice of these continual reassessment methods uh, because they seem to find the dose quicker, treat more subjects at the optimum dose, and estimate the optimum dose more accurate. And they have even gone here and said, well, such methods are encouraged. So this is uh, when, uh, that why we also included this new, this modern adaptive, uh, model-based type of methods. And with the exception of this 3 plus 3 design, all of them utilize the Bayesian methodology and the Bayesian paradigm. So this means that what we need to do at some point in the trial is we have to synthesize information that we have from prior 
uh, evidence, either from historical trials or from publications or by eliciting knowledge from experts, synthesize that in what we call a prior distribution, and then combine this prior distribution with the observed data that we have. And this will form our a posteriori view of things, or the posterior distribution, and our inference is going to be based on this posterior distribution or the posterior predictive distribution, uh, which is essentially going to be the distribution of your data conditional uh, integrated out over the posterior distribution. So the methods that we're going to be focusing on from now and on all utilize this approach, which is kind of the natural, the approach that you naturally tend to th think about. Like you have some a priori view about something, then you have evidence coming your way and that tends to update your view of things. So it is a more natural thing of, uh, natural way of thinking about things. So with the continual reassessment method, you still have this target toxicity in mind, this uh, 30 or 33 percent, but you also have uh, a single parameter model in mind, single parameter curve that will describe the relationship between dose and toxicity. And this will be an a priori view of things. And this will get continuously updated. So you will treat subjects at each dose level. You will observe how many toxicities you have. And then using Bayes' theorem, you will combine this a priori view along with the toxicities that you observe, which is your actual data, to form the posterior distribution. And actually, you're going to be interested in the mean of that posterior distribution for the probability of toxicity at each dose level. So then you will scan through all the dose levels. You have a corresponding probability of toxicity or the mean of that posterior distribution for the probability of toxicity. And whichever one is closest to your target is going to be the next recommended dose. So this process will just reiterate until you either exhaust your sample size that you had in mind, the maximum sample size, or you have met some termination uh, criterion. So with this, one thing, there, there are a couple of drawbacks. Uh, one of them is that you may or may not um, uh, increase so, some of the risks in the trial. Because what this tell, tells you, and probably, I don't know, hopefully you can see it from here, is that you have essentially a relationship between dose and uh, tox probability of toxicity. You might have a target toxicity level in mind with, the with something in the probability of 33%. So you might have your doses, dose levels, say for example. And if you are here, maybe then the software will say, okay, then the next dose level that is closest to the target without exceeding it is probably this one. So what you'll have to do is the, the model will say, well, skip a couple of doses. So skipping untried doses does not sit very well uh, with regulators and it also does not sit well with some of the other researchers that work on this. So they try to work on different modifications of the algorithm to avoid this. So you can put constraints on the algorithm to avoid skipping, uh, to maybe not escalate if you have observed a DLT at the current dose level. And this paper here by Goodman et al has examined these possible modifications and they have shown that, well, okay, even if you apply these modifications on the CRM, you're not going to be losing much. So this is actually what we have, are, have been using as the default version in EAST, the modified version of the CRM, but you will still have the flexibility to uncheck some boxes and then revert back to the original CRM or maybe loosen up some of the restrictions if you want. The um, and again, I'm going to scroll through some of the outputs because we're going to be seeing it in action. So the other, which is more important kind of uh, drawback of the method, is that escalation depends on this single posterior mean of the probability of toxicity at each dose level. So you are basing this on a point estimate and you are ignoring essentially what the uh, variability of that point estimate is going to be. So this is a situation where we have two different distributions which are centered around this goal of 30%, okay, so the mean is 0.3, so in both cases they would lead to the same decision, theoretically. However, with the red curve, which is centered at 0.3, the chance of observing a toxicity rate above 60% is very small. It's just this area under the curve, it's 2 out of 1,000. With the blue curve, which is also centered at 0.3, the chance of observing anything greater than 60% in terms of toxicity is much higher 
considerably higher. It's about 17%. So you want to somehow you know, take it, that into account, take this variability into account. And this next uh, process that we have added, the Bayesian logistic regression model by Neuschwander et al., uh, a group of statisticians at Novartis, um, has done that. So this is, by the way, the method that they are using by default uh, for their dose escalation programs, both at Novartis and at Roche. So instead of using a single parameter dose toxicity curve, they utilize a dual parameter dose toxicity curve. Both the intercept or log of the intercept and the, the slope of that curve are random quantities. You model them jointly with a bivariate normal distribution, which opens up another can of worms. How do you specify that bivariate normal distribution? And they define in a process what they, something that they call a reference dose, which is an arbitrary scaling dose, which allows you to get a better feel and interpret the parameters of these logistic regression. Because uh, alpha, the exponential of the, um, of the uh, intercept, can be interpreted then as the odds of a dose limit in toxicity at that reference dose. And the slope can be interpreted as the increase in the log odds of a DLT when you increase uh, the um, log dose for one unit. So this model, instead of using a point estimate for the target toxicity, it breaks the probability space down into intervals. And you're looking, instead of a point three, you're looking at an interval of a targeted toxicity. And what you try to do is you want to maximize your chances of falling into that interval. So the dose that will be selected next, next will be one that increases your chances of falling into the interval of targeted toxicity. At the same moment, they have also created intervals of underdosing uh, and intervals of overdosing. So typically you can either break them down into excessive toxicity interval or in an unacceptable toxicity interval, or you can collapse these two and just call this thing under uh, overdosing. And the approach that they um, um, recommend is that you should first deal with the overdosing part, try to limit that, limits, for example, the probability of overdosing, say, up to a cap, 25%, 20%, and subject to that, try and maximize the probability of falling in the targeted toxicity interval. Okay, so this is what they call the escalation with overdose control, and it's essentially a constrained optimization uh, problem. And this is also the default version in East, but again, you can use, uh, again, you can loosen up some of the restrictions, you can um, control how you want the dose keeping to be done, and so forth. Uh, the other thing, I mentioned that can of worms, is how do you specify this bivariate normal distribution? Uh, if you are able to put down mean and variances and correlations for that log alpha and log beta, then you are already a few steps ahead of me. I've never had good success in doing that, but so you can do that directly if you, if you want. But what we're advocating is to do this indirectly. So there is considerably work done, which allows you to actually elicit information from clinicians, from your clinical team, on a space that they're more, most comfortable giving you that information. So instead of, for example, trying to get what log alpha and log beta is in the mean and variance, try to get from them what do they think the chance of the toxicity probability is going to be, say, at the lowest dose in your dose range, and what do they think the, the best guess at the MTD is, of the MTD is going to be. And you just need these two points, because at the log, logit scale, this relationship between dose level and toxicity is linear. And if you have two points, you have everything else in between. And basically, this information can be converted into the prior distribution uh, this bivariate normal prior distribution. And you can either elicit information like the lowest dose, probability of the lowest dose and the guess for the MTD, or the probability for the lowest dose and the highest dose, or the probability for the lowest dose and the reference dose. So there's a mix and match of things. Um, and the, the advancement that we have made in this version of EAST is that we have this calculator which enables you instantaneously to see what the elicitation of these probabilities will be, uh, will translate into in the parameter space. While in the previous version of this, you, you kind of had to run it first and then look at your output uh, and see what that meant in terms of the parameters. 
So this is the method essentially that does that indirect prior specification and there is also a reference uh, in, the, in the reference section of the presentation. It's done by some researchers at Roche uh, by Hasson and Kinersley. So this is actually what we're going to try to see in action right now and try to get a little bit your hands dirty with the software. And it would be nice if you could actually follow up and you know, repeat anything that I do just to, uh, if you have your installation of uh, 6.4 or you have access to our Citrix uh, server. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be switching to the software here.